On behalf of Chief Executive Women, I'd like to acknowledge that we are recording on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land upon which we learn, work, create, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Driving the Equality Agenda. Driving, Driving the, the Equality, equality agenda. agenda. Driving the Equality Agenda. Are we there yet? Hello, and welcome to Driving the Equality Agenda, the podcast where I speak with some incredible leaders who are helping us understand what's really behind gender inequality and how we can reach our destination towards a more equal society. I'm Anne Burns, and I gotta tell you, I live and breathe this stuff because I'm so passionate about seeing real change. I don't wanna wait 100 years for it. I wanna see it all well within my lifetime. And for me, and Chief Executive Women, it has to start with women leaders enabling women leaders so that we can all thrive. Each episode, we cover topics to empower you with tangible skills, new habits and invaluable knowledge. So if you want to be truly inspired and understand what it takes to be a great leader, you're in the right place. On this episode, I spoke to Sue Lloyd Hurwitz, who is one of Australia's most prominent and successful businesswomen and industry leaders. From 2012, she made a mark as a visionary CEO and managing director of Mervac Property Group. She's won multiple Businesswomen of the Year awards and is described as a true leader of our time. When she was CEO at Mervac, they made significant achievements in diversity and inclusion. Now, she sits on multiple boards, including the Sydney Opera House Trust, and of course, she's also the current 19th president of Chief Executive Women. Sue has such an impressive legacy of corporate leadership in the modern world. She's a driving force in bringing equitable change to Australia. We see and hear an enormous strength in her words and a clear conviction in executing her mission of empowerment for all women. And we're so excited to welcome her here today. Welcome, Sue. Thank you for having me. It's lovely for you to be here. I know this is a crazy week, lots going on, so we're really grateful for your time. It's an absolute pleasure. And welcome back from New York. The 67th Commission on the Status of Women held in New York at UN Women's Global Headquarters. Tell me, what was that like? It was absolute chaos for a start. 8,000 women at the UN in New York and a really quite amazing experience to to experience being in a, a group of women and men um, all all focused on how we promote um, women's agendas to, and this was around technology and um, and digital learning that the theme was about but just seeing the the breadth of humanity there was something that that really blew me away you were in the hall of assembly what what was the atmosphere like well that was for actually for international women's day and so it was electric in there and uh, there were women from all over the world in, in national dress uh, and just celebrating International Women's Day and stories from women young and old from all around the world, different walks of life. Uh, it, was, it was quite an emotional experience. Fantastic. CW on the world stage. Well, a small part of the world stage, I think I really came away with the reminder that Australia is a long way away and we think we're multicultural, but there's a big world out there. Yeah, you haven't seen anything yet. What a great opportunity. I love the theme that they had for that storyline which was around digital and innovation and technology change and how that can accelerate gender equality what was your discussion there around particularly around data because I know that's something that's close to your heart what was your discussion well, it was actually about the, the it can be used for good or bad Ooh. and so the idea that um, technology and algorithms and data uh, they can actually ingrain and make unconscious bias explicit in algorithms that are going to then define what news people see and how they experience the internet. And so it was it was quite confronting to think about how we think about digital and get women into the front end of digital um, mm. so that there is there are women's voices at the table. Because as you know, at CW, that's something that we are talking about all the time, how to have equal participation at the decision-making tables in all spheres of our lives. Yeah. And this is a really important one where there is a serious underrepresentation of women at the digital table at the design end. And so that it can very well bake in um, bias into the system, which we then won't see. And we'll just take for granted um, as that that's truth when in fact it's a biased system programmed in a biased way, un unconsciously and without intent. But yeah. that's how it will turn out. I'm obsessed with Web3 and the evolution of the internet. And I certainly think that the evolution of technology is not a gender issue 
But unless we have equality in the whole discussion and the evolution of Web3, we're going to get left behind. Oh, and I think it will also shape the world that all of us live in, men and women. Um, if, if if the internet or Web3 is programmed in a way that is, that is coding in un, uh, this unconscious bias, that will shape lives for everybody, mm -hmm. not just for, for women. But I tell you one of the things that at the other end of the spectrum really, really struck me. I went to a panel um, that was hosted by some women from Afghanistan. Mm. And they were talking about their experience of life for women in Afghanistan. One of the women couldn't get through her speech. She was so emotional about what she had to talk about and the atrocities that they had to deal with. And I thought, that really puts your life into perspective. These women, they were risking their lives to come and speak, and they have to go back to their country having done that. And it was a very powerful moment that, yes, there's a big digital world out there, but there are places that are really, really tough to be a woman in, and that's one of them. That really stays with you, doesn't it, that yeah. echo? It drives you forward, and what a momentous couple of weeks it's been. I mean, the results at Mervac, again, second year in a row, being listed as number one in terms of gender equality across the globe. And I think there are 4,000 companies that were assessed. What an incredible moment, not just for Australia, but for Mervac and frankly, for you and your leadership. Oh, well, thank you. It is, we're the only company that, uh, that has won it twice and twice in a row. And there are 4,000 companies in that survey. But I think from an Australian point of view, what's really fascinating to me is that there are 4% uh, of companies in that uh, 4,000 are Australian. 4%? 4%. But 20% of the top 100 are Australian. Wow. And three of the top 10 are Australian. And that is very significant overrepresentation, and I think it speaks to the success of things like the Thirty Percent Club, the the movements that we've made towards women on boards, and we quite rightly talk about all the things that are wrong and all the things that we have to fix. But really, Australia is punching above its weight when it comes to representation in um, in that survey, which is a, a very thorough survey, as you say, of four thousand companies around the world. But I, I am very proud that Mervac has uh, been number one uh, twice in a row. So, how did you decide? to fundamentally change the culture when you arrived at Mervac? When I arrived at Mervac, uh, which is nearly 11 years ago now, and I've just handed over the CEO to Campbell last week, which was a very emotional experience for everybody in the room, him, me, and everybody else. Uh, but when I arrived, uh, staff engagement was 32%, which is a very toxic environment indeed. And it became very clear that we had to fundamentally shift the culture and it took years to get the snowball moving in the right direction and to get momentum. And it was just a thousand things that we did and tried and some worked and some didn't work. Um, we focused on basic management skills to start, focused on flexible working way before COVID. It was uh, our attempts to try and normalise flexibility to allow more women into the workforce. We were absolutely ruthless on um, pay equity when, and Mervax had a a zero light for light pay gap for the last seven years because we use data, as we were talking about before, to shine a light to say, this is a problem. Because without the data, people say, oh, that can't happen here. Nobody would intentionally pay women less than men. Of course, they wouldn't intentionally do it, but they do do it. And so when you have the data, you can see what is going on. And so for seven years in a row, when we've seen something that's not right from a pay gap, we just fix it on the spot. Um, and don't say, well, we'll, you, we'll, we'll work up to it. We just fixed it on the spot. And it has fundamentally shifted the culture. We work really hard on the values and the purpose of the organisation. As I, I've said a million times, people don't wake up in the morning and say, I should go generate some EPS today. <laughs> but they do wake up in the morning and think about legacy and impact and being part of something bigger than themselves and in so doing, create earnings. And having found that purpose and a voice around sustainability and uh, creating a culture where everybody could feel that they belonged, um, man, woman, um, any, any kind of sexuality, background, disadvantage, disability, to really try and create that, that safe environment for people. But it took a long time um, to get there. Uh, but I think now it is a place that uh, I've handed over to Campbell, a place where it is safe to belong, uh, as, a, as, as anybody can bring their full selves to work. Can't tell you the number of times people have said to me, this is the first place I've worked where I feel I can be a real human being. It is such a great benchmark for Australia that you've set with Mervac. Um, and what I love about it the most is traditionally construction, engineering, mining, utilities have always been seen as male-dominated industries. And what you've proven with Mervac is that is not the case. And that once you have deliberate 
interventions and decisions, you can change things very quickly. It probably felt like a long time. It did. (laughs) But to achieve that twice in a row on the global stage, to set a new benchmark for Australia is incredibly powerful. There is no excuse. There is, it can I, be done. It can be done. And I'll tell you a story about one of the things that was really the most powerful. Uh, back in 2014, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency came to us and said, we want to make an internet documentary and we want to make it about men starting to work flexibly. And would you be part of it? And I thought that's a great idea. And people say, you are completely crazy. <laughs> what man wants to work flexibly in the construction sector and to be filmed from the internet while doing it? Nobody will sign up. Well, of course, lots of people wanted to sign up. So it ended up being um, two Mervac men, two Telstra men and a cause partner. And one of the Mervac men was a construction foreman at Harold Park that we were building at the time. His father had also been a construction worker at Mervac. And there's a very touching uh, episode of this where the father and the son are talking uh, with the person making the documentary and the father was saying I never saw my son Adrian play sport not once because I was working in this environment where I worked six days a week and Adrian was saying I want to break that cycle and he is a yoga teacher with two young children and that said oh my goodness if a site foreman at Harold Park can work flexibly then Everybody can do it. I think as an internet documentary, it was a complete failure. I think about five (laughs) people watched it. But inside Mervac, that said that flexible working is mainstreamed and acceptable for everyone. Fantastic. What a great benchmark. I can't wait to see those stories of Mervac become legends and changing things across all industries. Well, as long as they don't believe their own legends. I'm okay, <laughs> always very careful when I tell the story of Mervac not to tell it in a very easy transformational hmm. way because, of course, it's not like that. It was hard. It was hard. And there are lots yeah. of things that didn't work and went wrong. And it's got humans in it. It's a system of, of human beings who are all fallible. And so it's, uh, yeah, we, I, I'm always very careful. You don't believe your own story too much. Exactly right. Speaking of your story, I mean, you definitely have your reputation around being a, an agent for change and an agent for transformation. You're very passionate about certain topics. And again, momentous news this week, you are about to be on the board of Rio Tinto. I am. Congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. What a great opportunity that is to continue their transformation. What are your thoughts about that and that particular industry? Oh, it's obviously a really important industry from the sustainability perspective and also from a cultural and gender transformation perspective. Uh, I'm very proud of everything that Mervac has done around sustainability over many years, getting to net zero, scope one and scope two, nine years ahead of target, having very definitive and published plans for scope three, water, waste and energy, social impact and so forth. But unless we decarbonise the extractive industries and the supply chain, we're not decarbonising the world. And so I think it is very, very important for uh, for companies that are involved at that end of the supply chain to be very conscious about how to do what the world needs us to do, but in a, in a better way. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful announcement. Congratulations. Thank you. We are very proud of you uh, as our president, but also with the roles that you do. And we're looking forward to the, the next evolution of CW. You bring with you an energy, a decisiveness around change. So what is your view of the evolution of chief executive women? I think CEW is clearly at an inflection point. Um, I was very fortunate to have lunch with uh, the elders, the founders of CEW the the other week, and I was really struck by how radical these women were and are still. I want to be them when I'm <laughs> 80. And the, over the 37 years, this, the organisation has changed dramatically. You know, a few years ago, it was 300 members. Now it's 1,100 members. There are 2,000 people in a connect community. We're putting 450 people through a leaders program, which is transformational. It has, as you know, a net promoter score of 100. I've never seen a net promoter score of 100. You are changing people's lives with that program. Oh, thank you. And it's clear that we're at an inflection point of what is the next stage of of the journey of CEW. And I, I think it uh, continues to be a women's organisation, but really where we've evolved to is is women leaders empowering women for all women, for the good of all. Because we know that for example, increasing female participation in the workplace, that is the single biggest economic lever we have in this country to improve wealth for all. Not just women, but for all. Mm. So this is about men and women working together um, to improve gender equality, not in a men versus women way, but in a 
When women are at the table, better decisions are made. When women participate in the workforce more, they have more superannuation, they don't retire into poverty. Uh, there, there are, there's wealth created. There are many, many studies that show what would be created in terms of GDP and extra um, skilled workforce in Australia, which we clearly need if there was female participation enabled by things like childcare that was accessible and affordable and so forth. So I think CW's mission is really about women leaders, of which there are now 1,100, empowering women for the good of all people in Australia. How wonderful is that? I love the economic logic that goes with the discussion around gender equality. We're not just talking about women's issues, we're actually talking about economic decisions and economic choices for the prosperity of all Australians. I think that's that's absolutely true. I mean, it, it is absolutely good for women, that, that there is no doubt. It is equitable. Yes, it is, is that. But fundamentally, it is good for all. It is better for all when there is equal participation for all at the table, making decisions in all spheres of our society, whether it's politics or corporate or small business or sport or cultural, health, education, where, wherever it is, uh, we are better off when there is equal opportunity for all. No question. I'm very excited about the evolution of Chief Executive Women. I really get a sense of momentum and the force of change and the force that actually will change people's lives. So I think that is an incredible privilege for us to do that. What, what would you ask of women leaders as we make this change, this evolution? What would you ask of women leaders? I actually have been doing, as you know, a lot of listening since I've, I took on the president role last November and going around the country listening to members and non-members and women from all walks of life, uh, thinking about how, how we do take this next step in the evolution of creating a, an equitable society for all. And I think the ask is of men and women, not just for women. Um, how do we how do we work on the things that are visible and very obvious that are um, make life generally more difficult to walk through life as any other group other than generally a white man, um, any other non-dominant group, whether that's women or any other non-dominant group. There are so many things that are explicit that we need to work on, like gender pay gap, for example, like um, making sure that we've got women on boards, women in senior management, right down to uh, getting girls in high school to think about STEM subjects so that they can funnel into, into that sphere. Uh, so that I think there is a, a lot for, for us all to do, for, uh, both on the explicit but also on the implicit. Because I think we all know that uh, as much as we try, we all bring unconscious bias to things. I think Julia Gillard said it really well when she said that we've never lived in a world free of stereotypes and you can't undo all that social conditioning just with an act of your will. And even when we are all on high alert for unconscious bias, it's there in how we make assumptions about people. That's how brains are wired. We're wired to make shortcuts. It's how we actually survive. And so some of those shortcuts are unhelpful mm. because we associate men with certain things and women with certain things. And men and women do it. Uh, so this is not a, a, a men's issue. This is for all, us all to really be alert to that unconscious bias and test ourselves uh, all the time on, on how we're going with you know, what assumptions we're making about the person that's right in front of us and um, that we're, we're not vocalising to ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I am constantly aware of my cognitive flaws and I'm constantly practising at the moment critical thinking to, t to unravel some of those biases that come from our childhood, from our upbringing, from our professional careers. Let's go way back for a second because I'm really intrigued to discover, was this all part of you growing up, this decisiveness, this force for change, this inner confidence that you have? Did this just evolve over time or were you always this way? That's a, it's a very good question and it's hard to think about yourself in, in history, but uh, I, I think I've evolved over time. Uh, I've always been very efficient. So that's certainly always <laughs> been a hallmark of, of me. And I've always been curious and, and driven. Um, but I, I wouldn't say I've always been confident. I think I certainly suffer from imposter syndrome. And many times over the years, I've thought I'm just about to be found out any minute. <laughs> They're going to know I've been faking it all this time. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say I'm an overly confident. A confident person. I'm, I'm certainly an introvert, and, and but I'm in an extrovert job. Uh, so there's some dissonance that comes along with that. But I guess fundamentally, I was always taught that to those to whom much is given, much is expected. And I love much was always expected. And so there was never any grand plan. I always hated that interview question, you know, where do you want to be in five years' time? Like, I don't really know, actually. I can't answer that in an interview. But as long as it's interesting and I'm learning, then that's that's 
what that's what I want. And it just evolved that way. Thing after thing after thing happened that were all interesting. I never had an ambition to be an ASX 50 CEO at all. First time that they called me, I was buying shoes for Ben in John Lewis in <laughs> London, where I thought I was not John Lewis. I thought I was in London for forever. And um, they called me and said, are you interested in an ASX 50 CEO role? I said, no, thank you. Recommended somebody else and carried on buying the shoes. Wow. So it was never an ambition or a plan. And when they called up a second time four months later, I thought, ah, oh, probably should pay attention now. This probably doesn't knock on your door twice in your life very often. So paid attention. And uh, 11 years later, here we are with me having, having handed over to an internal successor at Mervac. Fantastic. And Australia has been the lucky country for you as it has been for me. I mean, we're both English born Australians. I found the working environment here and the culture of acceptance here far better than I probably would have experienced somewhere else. Although I can't compare because I've been here a long time. Australia for you, has it been the lucky country? Well, I spent a lot of time out of Australia as well as in it. I think for my parents, it certainly was the lucky country. I'm When we moved to Manchester when I was three and lived there till the, what was the winter of discontent, which was 1979, mm. uh, which was a, a very turbulent time in the UK. And my, my parents, in search of a better life, my father up and came to Australia, found a job, had to prove that no Australian could get it, went back home, collected his family, hadn't sold the house, took a big risk, came across this country. Um, and now that I think about it, what an absolutely courageous thing for them to have done that in mid-career. They knew nobody, absolutely nobody. And here we were on the other side of the world with you know, my mum with a, a 12-year-old and, and twin nine-year-olds uh, finding their way in this country. So I think definitely for them it has been the lucky country. I guess I've been lucky enough to live all around the world in different places. So certainly in Australia, I uh, doing my MBA in France, lived in uh, in New York, which I loved, California and San Francisco, which I also loved, uh, and, and then London. So we're very fortunate. We've actually got – each child was born on a separate continent, so we've got passports <laughs> like this. When we talk a bit like a spy family, we're not entirely sure what passport we're supposed to be using at any point in time. That's great. Your kids must be very proud of you. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. They're, they keep me honest. There's no getting ahead of yourself in, in my house at all. Uh, they will uh, ruthlessly pin down anything that they see as corporate smugness or spin or theatre. Um, I have one child that is very fond of pointing out rampant overdevelopment. Um, I always imagine him out there with the placard. Uh, uh, they're very socially conscious. And so I think... I think I learn from them um, in how they think about the world and how they think about right and wrong and how society should function. So there's, there's absolutely no getting ahead of yourself around my dinner table. We talk a lot about Gen Z and how bold and courageous they are. Are your kids bold and courageous? I think in all in their different ways, yes, they are. One, one of the things I do notice particularly about my, my daughter is that I think you and I are of a generation of women that if I compliment you on that dress, you would go, oh, this old thing, and you deflect the compliment. My daughter would just say, thank you, which is entirely the right thing that thank you should you. do. <laughs> thank you. It is a nice dress. Uh, so so I, I do notice that sort of more centred nature of, of less deflection in, in her. Um, and uh, you know, children, as you know, they all come wired. They're, they're, all, yeah. they're all their own selves in their different ways. Yeah. Do you feel that through your career you've had to dig deep around courage, particularly moral courage, some of the decisions you've had to make and some of the situations you've been uh, how do you how do you drum up that courage? How do you triumph in the midst of adversity? Well, I think there have been a, a couple of instances, and I probably won't share the, the details of them, a couple of ones where I've had to deal with uh, people whose sense of ethics were, were very, very different than mine. If there's a line that you're not supposed to cross, I'm over here somewhere. I've had to work with people. One, one time when I was quite young, who were always just on the other side of that line, and I'd never met people like that before. I didn't really know that they existed in my naivety. So I had to work out how to deal with it, but I, I never saw it as courage because I felt like I had no choice, mm. that what they were doing was was wrong. And I had, I had no choice at that point. So it's not courageous, it's just necessity is how I thought about it when, when those situations came up. That's brilliant, I love that. It's not courageous, it's necessity. Yeah, it's difficult when you're right on that line and you, your gut tells you from your family values that that's just not right. And I really get a sense of that with chief executive women. Some of the things that are happening in this country are just not right and we're here to fix it. And we have a, this incredible force and momentum for change with you at the lead. So as I do with all of my guests on this podcast, we ask for one piece of advice, one for the road, if you like. What is your one piece of advice to leaders, both men and women, 
around being courageous and bold as we travel this journey towards true gender equality? I think that the thing that's always struck me is that there are a lot of different ways to be a leader, but there's only one that's authentic to you. So finding that and finding your power in your authentic self, not in an imitation of someone else, mm. whether that's someone of the same gender or a different gender uh, or a different style, but finding your own your own voice and and being and standing in that place, I think that's something I wish I'd learned a bit earlier. Well, thank you. Thank what you. a momentous week it's been. You've been so generous with your time. Jet lag announcements. So we really appreciate your time, thank and you. uh, we're super excited about what happens next at Chief Executive Women. Thank you so well, much. Excited to go on the journey with everybody. You've been listening to Driving the Equality Agenda, a podcast brought to you by Chief Executive Women. To find out more about CW's leadership development programs, please visit cw.org.au. Use the hashtag driving the equality agenda if you have any questions or connect with me and Burns via LinkedIn. I love hearing from you. Ask me anything. We'd love to include you in our conversations. Quick call out and thank you to our producer Sarah Linton and the amazing team at Cobox. You can read more about this episode by checking out the show notes. And make sure to follow us so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks so much for listening and we'll catch you next time.